Psalm 100 says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His court with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And His faithfulness to all generations. Stand and sing with us if we give praise and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ.
outside of time, the God who sets outside of creation that, Father, the earth is but your footstool. God, may we see you today by the quickening of your spirit as the great, magnanimous, infinite, glorious, holy, magnanimous God that you are. And may we worship you, Father, in a way that is worthy of you, that way that's fitting to you. And may our praise today waffle up before your throne as a soothing aroma that's pleasing to you. And Father, when lost men and women who may be here today see the people of God praising you in a way that is befitting to you, may they be drawn to salvation in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Glad that you're here today. And uh, we are just always honored for everyone who comes to worship at Bel Air. It's a great place to be together to worship today. Listen, as the guys come forward, we want to take a moment just to welcome our guests. And I already met several guests today. I know I didn't meet all. Didn't get around to everybody. So we're glad that you're here. That's what we want you to know. If you're a guest today, I don't care if it's your very first time or second, third, fourth time. In fact, if you come back after being here the first time, that makes you even more appreciated you came back. So we're glad you're here at whatever times it is. And uh, we'd like to ask you to do something for us, uh, if, especially if it's your first time. But if you've never done this, if, if you've been here before, would you look on the right-hand side of your worship bulletin and there's a tab that provides a place for your full information out about yourself. Would you do that right now in a few moments and tear it off, drop it off from plate when it comes by, and we would consider that your gift to us. But we appreciate you being here. Now listen, these guys down here, they've been up all night ready for this moment right now. <laughs> Can't you tell they're pumped, they're excited, waiting to spring into action. So don't disappoint them, okay? Same is true for the young man up there. He's a teenager. He's a little more laid back. But he's ready to spring match too. We want to give a gift package in your hand if you're a guest today. We really do. So right now with me, would you just raise your hand if you're a guest and let these guys spring in action? Thank you all so much. You're so great. Thank you. Brother Ed, right here at the end of the road down there. Keep it up. Keep right. them up. We got a short attention span. All right, need one over here, Dale. Over here, brother David. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Y'all did a wonderful job. I tell you what, let's give these guys a hand. Y'all ready to worship God in a way that He's worthy? Amen. Let's focus on Him. But let's begin by standing up and just greeting somebody next, next to us, will you?
most gracious and merciful God. I want to know that your love is amazing, Lord. To know that your grace is so amazing. That you would look our way, Lord. And you would see us in our recovery. And yet you would reach down and offer up a sacrifice for us. That, Lord, we can be made right in your sight. So, Father, I just pray for hearts this morning. As we hear Randy preach your word, Lord, may you speak to us. What you want from us. That we would believe and obey you, Lord. And I pray also, Lord, that as we give, Lord, that we would give from our hearts to you, to know that you look at our hearts, Lord, when we give. And I pray that you would bless it, Lord, and make your name famous in your world. In Jesus' name.
for his loving kindness is everlasting. Then down in verse 23, who remembers us in our lowly estate? For his, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And has rescued us from his our best adversaries. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Who gives food to all flesh. For his, ever, his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of heaven. For his loving kindness is everlasting.
Lord, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, die on the cross for my sins, to pay the debt I owed, because your loving kindness lasts forever. Lord, you made each and every one of us in this place to worship you. Lord, to worship you daily. To worship you, Lord, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Lord, I'd be kidding myself to think I'd do that or anyone really does that in this room. But Lord God, I pray when we leave this place this morning, Lord, because of the hearing of your word, the preaching of the word, Lord God, we can't help to be more like your son Jesus today. Lord, you sin because your loving kindness lasts forever. Lord, help us to show that loving kindness to a lost and dying generation. Help us to be that love, to show people that love by Christ living through us. Lord, as we prepare for revival, Lord, start that today, Lord, in these shoes. May it start like a brush fire, and we can't keep it contained. And let us see you do some mighty and powerful things, Lord God, because your loving kindness lasts forever. Your Son, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. If I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. V. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me. Our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing, I'd have judges promoting pornography, Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey. Good day. That's his signature sign-off. Paul Harvey, good day. Can we have some house lights? I have a hard enough time keeping them awake when I preach with lights on. <laughs> 
That's his signature sign off good day, but after listening to that, you realize it's not a good day in America, is it? Amen? Amen. Last week we began our first of three uh, sermon installments, today being the second, on trying to prepare this church, not some other church, this church for revival. Revival will not come because Richie Allen drives from the Panhandle of Florida down here and preaches to us. Revival will not come because the music minister coming from uh, Texas comes and shows up and sings with us and for us. Revival will only come when you and I quit playing around with God and get serious with God. And that's why last week we looked at the subject of what is revival. It would be good if we're going to have revival to first of all know what it is. Some think it's a bunch of emotional services and, and, and a lot of people getting saved. And it might contain that, but we looked last week that revival is first and foremost from beginning to end a work of God. It's something only God can do. And secondly, that it's a tremendous breaking. That we've got to be willing to let God break, not somebody else, but me. And that if I will allow God to break me, God will gloriously remake me into what he wants me to be, just like the potter does with the clay. And then finally, after God remakes me, a revival will be a great pouring out. You know what the best hope for the lost people in our community in America today is? It is a revived people of God. That is the best hope that the world has. And that's what we looked at last week. And, and as I was thinking, I had a good friend say to me, you know, have you ever heard that Paul Harvey on If I Were the Devil? And I said, I have heard that, brother. He said, that would, that would really go well with these messages. And I said, thank you for letting God use you. And I went back and listened to it. And I thought it was a good lead-in because last week we started with uh, some news stories of where our country is at. Well, it's not gotten any better in the last week. The devil has been good at what he does. Amen? We see the lawlessness and the riots and the refusal to let justice take its course in Ferguson, Missouri. And we see everything that we see. Leonard Ravenhill, who he, along with Owen Richard Roberts, are probably two of the uh, best... Uh, speakers, writers, preachers on revival in modern day history. He said America does not have revival because America does not want revival. Now that's one thing to be said about America, but it would be a terrible thing to be said about Bel Air Baptist Church. Wouldn't you agree? Does Bel Air Baptist Church want revival? Well, I want to speak to you today. When will revival come? Making our way back to God. That's a hard thing for us to admit today. The first thing that we're going to have to be willing to admit that we probably all, including me, to some degree have drifted away from God. Would you stand with me as we read James chapter 4? I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. 7 and 8. See, God's already speaking. He told Job, he said, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Do you send a lightning bolt on the <laughs> You know, that's, that's everybody's dream, though. Okay, yeah. He says, Job, do you send a lightning bolt on its course and make it answer back to you and say, here I am? That's just the lightning bolt answering back to God. Amen. Amen. James chapter 4, verse 7. The Bible says, Submit your, therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Father, we come to you right now, Father, and we just ask that, Father, we wouldn't sit here today and think about how everybody out there needs to return to you but that each of us, by your gracious enabling, through the power of your Holy Spirit, might put our own hearts under a microscope today. And that, Father, we might see areas, or, or vast areas, or small areas of our lives that we are not totally surrendered to you. That, Father, we would make our way back to you today. For your glory, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, as we read that text today, 
I think something ought to just automatically jump out at us because the text really speaks for itself that if we're going to have revival, it is a two-step process. But also, before we get into the two-step process, that if we don't have revival, it won't be because of a shortfall on God's part. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 8, that if we will draw near to God, what does God promise to do? He will draw near to us. So, brothers and sisters, I say to you this morning, if God doesn't show up at Bel Air Baptist Church, if we don't have revival when Brother Richie comes, it won't be because God has not done His part. It will be because we've not prepared our hearts and we've not been willing to do what we need to do to draw near to God. But did you see in verse 7 the two-step process? It's step number one is to submit to God. Now, we're naturally sinners, and that's not going to come naturally to us to submit to God. And the second one is to resist the devil. It's interesting. I don't think America today is doing a very good job of resisting the devil. Do you? And I would say, brothers and sisters, if you don't do step one, submit to God, you're not going to do step two without doing, first of all, step one. You know, that's why the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, it says, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now, it amazes me how I can preach a sermon on any given Sunday, and if I might preach a sermon on about watch your tongue, that nothing the devil would like better than to get into church and get people talking unhealthy talk and slandering one another, and, and I can preach a sermon and God be in it and hear people talking about somebody as I'm going out in the foyer. Now, that's just an example of what the Bible means when we need to pay closer attention. We need to let the Word of God do more than just get us excited. Amen? Yeah. We need to pay attention to what we're hearing. And the Bible goes on to say in Hebrews 2, 1, we need to pay closer attention to what we've heard so that there's a reason we need to pay closer attention that we do not drift away from it. You see, the thing I've noticed about fishing and being out in a boat, that, that there's a current that it takes absolutely no intentional effort. It takes no effort at all to drift. Have you ever thought about that? Drifting, by and large, is an unintentional act because all you've got to do to drift is nothing. And brothers and sisters, can I tell you something spiritually in the church today? And it does no good for me to preach to anybody else than us, Amen. Because I'm not the pastor of some other church. I'm the pastor of Bel Air. Do you know what the biggest problem at Bel Air is today? Is that we don't put enough effort in of being intentional about what we have heard. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, we got some of the best Sunday school teachers on the Gulf Coast. Yeah. We are a church that doesn't just believe the Bible contains the Word of God. It is the Word of God. You've got a pastor that may not be Adrian Rogers, but I dedicate myself to preaching the truth to you, and I'm here to tell you that if we're going to have revival, we better quit drifting. We better pay closer attention to what we've heard because it is possible, brothers and sisters, that we're drifting from the God of the Bible. Do, do, do we understand today that knowing a person is more involved than knowing about a person. Now, I know about a lot of people, but I don't know not as many people as I know about because knowing somebody, that, that really knowing a person includes great intentionality. It, it requires effort on my part to get to know them. And can I tell you as we think about revival, the one person that we must know is an infinite being who is separated from us by immeasurable distance of holiness and purity and majestic glory. It is the God of heaven. It is the God of creation. That is the one that we are coming Commanded that we must know. And there is nothing in your life and nothing in my life that will ever take greater priority than the task assigned to you and the task assigned to me of knowing this infinite being. 
But at the same time, because of who we naturally are, which is sinners, we, we prefer to keep God at a safe distance, don't we? You do realize, don't you, that if you get to knowing God, the true God, it's going to change your life. Amen? And we need to start out with some truth today. There's some people here today, you don't want to be broken. You don't want to be remade. You don't want to be poured out because that means it's going to take some effort to change or allow God to change your life. You'd very much rather just keep drifting because that doesn't take any effort at all. So I want us to look at two matters set before us today. One of them being, what is required for someone to truly know this God? What is required to really know God? And secondly, how does someone who's drifted away from God return to the God of the Bible? How do you get back? If, if you realize today, you know, I've not been intentional about knowing this God. How do I get back? Because you know, revival is for the people of God. Amen? Amen? You may be here today and you don't know Christ. You're not saved. Revival's not for you because you're dead. You're dead in trespasses and sin. That's not a put down. That's a call for you today before you leave here to get saved. Amen. But revival is to bring back to life. Revival is like pouring water on a wilted plant so it springs back to life. And brothers and sisters, you can't revive something that's dead. So when I'm talking about making our way back, I'm talking to God's people, not lost people. I'm talking to me. I'm talking to you. How do we make our place back? As we begin our time together today, I want us to take just a moment. I want to ask each one of you all to answer this question in your heart right now. Let's just get it settled right now. And the question is this, am I willing to do all that is necessary to return to God? Am I willing to do all that's necessary to return to God? You see, that's the first step of revival, isn't it? Just to be willing. I want us to look, first of all, making our way back to God. Quit acknowledging God without knowing God. Quit acknowledging God without knowing God. The Bible talks about in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. Now this is written to a people of God who have turned their back on God. And the Bible says in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, the Word of God says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who have despised my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? Then in verse 10, God goes on to say, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts nor will I accept an offering from you. Do we understand something today? That it is possible to acknowledge the existence of God without actually knowing God. You need to look no further for a biblical text proof for that than to look at the people of God, the nation of Israel. They were a nation here in Malachi. What is going on is there's a whole lot of religious activity going on. Did you see that? They are still going to the temple. They are still uh, offering sacrifices. They are still doing temple worship. And instead of pleasing God, it ends up being a stench in God's nostril because they don't honor God for who He is. They are not... Uh, uh, respecting God for the Master and Lord that He is. They are worship Him in a way that pleases them and not in a way that pleases God. You see, the possibility of being involved in a church, such as Bel Air Baptist Church, the possibility of being involved in church activities and not knowing God is difficult for us to face with complete honesty, isn't it? 
We tend to think, well, if I'm involved in church and if I'm busy doing church stuff, then surely I know the God of the Bible. Yet, brothers and sisters, it's a possibility that I encourage all of us today to consider. It wasn't a problem for Israel. Did you notice that God singles out the priest? He, he's not talking in Malachi about those out there. He's talking about those in here. And he's not only talking about those in here, he's talking about the leader of those in here, the priest. Brothers and sisters, we got pastors and churches that are standing in a pulpit and instead of preaching the Word of God, thus saith the Lord, they're saying this book's no longer true or relevant. And I'm telling you, God is not pleased. And there's a great danger that we need to be aware of today. A great danger in the church today. A great danger in modern Christianity in the United States today. And that danger is that there is a great gap a great separation between the Christianity we see in the Bible and the Christianity we're living in our own lives. And God said to His people in Malachi, He said, your worship is so dishonoring. The lives you're living is so disrespectful to me. I wish somebody put a padlock on the church house door. I wonder today, what would God look at your life and my life if I could have an honest evaluation of my service and worship of God? Would God say to me, Randy, I am not pleased with you. What motivates me to do what I do? What motivates you? I want us to examine as we think about this issue, examine that there are signs that we ought to be able to answer that question. Is God pleased with me? There are signs in the life of a person that acknowledges God's existence that doesn't really know God. There, there are sure enough signs that you can count on. Oh, spend just a minute. Let's look at some of those signs. What would be one of the signs? It would be, number one, that, that when you live as if you have no king but yourself, you can be assured you're somebody who's acknowledging God that you don't really know God. When you live like you are self-ruled, you see, people who do not tr truly know God are going to demonstrate it in their lives. You want to know what's wrong with America today? You want to look at and explain the news today? I explain it to you. We no longer know God. Amen? We are a bunch of reprobate people that turned our back on the God who blessed us. You want to explain what's going on in Ferguson, Missouri? That's in the news even today? It ain't about race. It's about a bunch of sinners doing what their sinful heart wants to do. Now, brothers and sisters, you can rest assured that when you live life like you have no king but yourself, your life's going to show it. It's not going to show it because you're living an irreligious life. It's not going to necessarily show it because you're not religious, but it's going to show it in that you live like you're self-ruled. You have no king but yourself. I think about the book of Judges, one of my favorite books in the Bible, because it's like reading the daily newspaper. But Judges in chapter 2, verse 10 says this, And there arose a generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work that he had done for Israel. Do you want to know what's wrong with the United States of America today? We no longer know the Lord. Now, I, I don't say this with pleasure. I, I don't say it. There, there is very few people here that would have any more patriotic heart and grateful to be living in the United States of America than me. But brothers and sisters, as a pastor and as a believer in Jesus Christ, I've got to be honest when I'm dealing with spiritual things. What's wrong with America today is we've got generation after generation has been raised up, don't know the Lord. Amen. And you can rest assured if you don't know the Lord, your life is going to show it. Amen. Now, America on the one hand has never been more spiritual. We've never been more Oprah Winfrey. We spiritual. We think all kinds of kind thoughts about God, Allah. You know, it's all the same. You know, that I'm talking about our culture, sister. 
It's all the same according to our culture. You don't matter what you call it. We've never at the same time been more spiritual, more religious, and more lost at the same time. So we need to get out of our head that being religious equals knowing God. You see, people who don't know God are going to show it in the way that they live. Now that's the way the book of Judges begins. Notice how it ends. In Judges chapter 17, verse 6, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now let me ask you something, beloved. Does that not explain where we're at today? Does that not explain where we're at today? In the church, as well as outside the church. You see, the problem with America is the church that's in America. The problem with darkness is that there's not light. The problem with America is there's not any salt that's savoring America. And that used to be the church. Now, we're going to have to get over our apathy and start getting honest with God. Quit playing around with God if we're going to be honest and say, it's, it's my heart that i got to put under the microscope. If it's going to change, it's got to start with me. It's got to start with you, sister. It's got to start with you, brother. It's got to start with Bel Air Baptist Church. Because when you don't truly know God, you're going to demonstrate it. And I want to ask you today, as we look at this first characteristic of somebody who acknowledges God, but doesn't live like they know God, does any of this, is the Holy Spirit talking to you right now about any of this, that some of this, all of this describes your life? Who is it that truly is Lord of your life? Answer it to yourself. You're the one that's got to stand before God and answer it to God one day. Who is it that truly rules over your life? Is it King Jesus? Or is it you? What determines the choices you make when nobody else is around? When, when you're free to make whatever choice that's set before you and nobody else is around, who helps you make that choice? The Lordship of Jesus or your own opinion of what's right and wrong and what you want to do? Characteristic number one for those who acknowledge God's existence without knowing God is that they live like they have no king. But number two, when you're clever and getting your own way, you think that clever people would be smart in every area of your life, wouldn't you? Listen to what the Bible says, what God says to a people that's backslidden in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. God says, for my people, not the lost, the church. For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children and have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil. But to do good they do not know. Now, that almost seems like an oxymoron. On one hand, God says they're stupid. Did you know that sin will make you stupid? It'll make you do the stupidest things you've ever known. But on the other hand, they're shrewd to do sin. You know, I couldn't tell you the times that I've had people tell me that the Bible is too hard to understand. These people have got college degrees. These people have got advanced degrees. And they tell me, the Bible's too hard for me to understand. Preacher, you don't understand Christian living, Christian life the way it is in the Bible. That's too hard for me to do. God is too difficult for me to know. He's mystic. He's unknowable. God, you're asking me to do things. Well, brother and sister, if that describes you, you need to get saved. You need to get under the Holy Spirit of God. But brother and sister, if you're saved, it's not because the Bible's too hard for you to understand. You don't want to understand it. Yes. If you've got the Holy Spirit. But on the other hand, while you're complaining that that's the case, you're very clever in getting your own way. You're very skillful in living for yourself and justifying it with religious jargon or religious words. Characteristics of somebody that acknowledges God's existence but doesn't really know God is one, they live like they have no king but themselves, and secondly, they're clever and getting our way, which leads us to the third thing, is that when you live by your own desires instead of God's word, 
The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 9, 13, the Lord said, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but have walked after the stubbornness of their heart, and after the bells, now watch this, as their fathers taught them. Do you understand what God's people are doing here? When God says this in Jeremiah, you see, they, they were living in a world of spiritual deceit. Uh, they were in a world of self-delusion. They refused to know their own God. And they were purposely forsaking God's Word and going after things that, that uh, God had forbidden them to go. The Bible says they walked after the stubbornness of their heart as their father had taught them. You know, we really ought to quit fooling ourselves into thinking that everyone that doesn't know God is not religious. Amen? We, we need to get over that. The Israelites were still active in their religious activity. They continued to read the Torah. They continued to read the law. They just didn't obey it. No big deal. I read my Bible every day. It doesn't change my life. They were still going to the temple. They were still worshiping. They were still having service. They just didn't let it affect them. Why? The Word of God says because their religion was merely a repetition of the wrong ideas about God that had been handed to them, to them from their parents, from their culture, from their upbringing. I never will forget. Brenda and I had bought our home about seven years ago and the, uh, had something wrong with the heat pump, which uh, Tommy Fortenberry and, <laughs> and uh, Keith Turner and Taylor's up in a very hot attic. And uh, so the people that put it in was up in the attic, and I was sitting down there in my air conditioning because uh, I had two units and one unit was working, so I stayed on that side of the house. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, do you know whether that man up in the attic saved or not? What are you doing down here? Honestly. So I go up in the attic. And I get to talking to that man while he's working. Sweat running down my face, but I'm talking to him. And I keep asking him this and that. And I'm turning it to spiritual things. And I'm telling you, no matter what I ask that man, he always said, I know that, but my daddy always said. And then I turn him right back to the Word of God. And I said, well, you know, that's all fine and good. But the Bible says, and then every time, this went on for 10 minutes, he would always come back and say, but my daddy said. And I finally told him as kindly as I knew how to tell him, I said, Brother, you're in good shape as long as it's your daddy on Judgment Day that's judging you. Now, now I want to ask you something. If God showed you today that there's something you're doing, something you're believing or something you're not believing, if God showed you right now that you need to be doing something you're not doing or not doing something you're doing because it is in contradiction to God's Word and you realized you do it or you believe it because of your traditions, not because of the Bible, what would you do? Would you be like that guy and just say, well, God, my daddy said it. You see, I talk to people all the time. They, they want to get closer to the Lord, but they only come to church on Sunday morning and then only sporadic. And listen, we appreciate and treasure everybody that comes. So don't think I, I'm putting you down, but, but the truth is you get to talking to them because God begins working in their life and you say, well, brother, why don't you get in a Sunday school class and why don't you be more faithful? Why don't you come on Wednesday night? Why don't you come on Sunday night? Why don't you submerge yourself in the church and see what God will do with that? Well, you don't understand. I was raised in a family and we only went to church on Sunday morning. Well, you see, that's my point, isn't it? What if God showed you right now that you need to change something because it's in contradiction to His Word what would you do? Are you willing to let God, will you, are you willing to let knowing God the way He wants you to know Him supersede your cultural heritage and your traditions and the way that you've always done it? What if God showed you that some influence in your life, in your family, in your church is cultural and it's interfering with knowing Him better, it's interfering with pleasing Him, what would you do? But I want you to notice the fourth sign of somebody that's acknowledging God's existence. 
but not really truly knowing him, is when you continually find your deepest satisfaction from someone or something other than God. When you continually find your deepest satisfaction in something or someone other than God. Listen to what God said. And I'm, I'm reading these texts out of Jeremiah because that's the deal. God's wanting to revive a people of God and they're backslidden. And he's reaching out, begging them to return. <coughs> Listen to what God said in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? Wow. But my people have changed their glory. For that which does not profit, be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. What are they? They have forsaken me, the fountains of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You see, there's someone here today, and you never dreamed you'd be where you're at. You never dreamed you, you would go so far. You never dreamed you'd be doing what you're doing. You never dreamed your marriage, your family would be in the shambles that it's in. And you're saying to yourself today, how in the world did I get here? Maybe it's this. Maybe you've created two great evils. One, you have forsaken God, who is the fountain of living waters, to hew out cisterns that are broken, that cannot hold water, that cannot satisfy. It amazes me the people whose lives are falling apart and you reach out to them with compassion and love and you share the gospel, you share Christ. You, or If they claim to be saved, you share with them what God's plan for them is, how a saved life ought to look and how it ought to be lived. And they keep doing the same thing, Brother Randy, and they keep being surprised that their life is still falling apart. Man, has a nation ever changed its God for a, one that's not a God? Yes, the United States has changed our God for one who's not a God. Has a nation ever been a, a, began to hew out broken cisterns and looking for life satisfactions in things that are not from God and of God? Yes, the United States of America has. That's why we got to put metal detectors at the schoolhouse door so they don't take their AR-15s in and start killing each other. That's why we got to put uh, metal detectors at the airport so they don't blow up the planes. That's why we have to have right police so they don't loot stores because of something that displeased them. You see, when the people of God are satisfied to go away from God rather than run to God, when the people of God are satisfied to pursue things that cannot satisfy their thirst, they, that will not profit, you can be sure that that is a people who have exchanged their God for that which is not a God and no longer know God. And the question is, as I put my heart under the microscope, what is it? What is it in my life that I feel I've got to have in addition to God in order to find contentment? Can you answer that in your heart today? What is it that you've got to have in addition to God before you can find contentment? Is there something you want so badly that you will even disobey God to get it? Sex? Sex? Drugs, alcohol, what? What do, you, what do you want so bad that you would disobey God to get it? Preacher, are, are, are you telling me that you can be a, a member of a good church like Bel Air? And this is a good church. It can be better, but it's a good church. You tell me I can be a member and I can be involved even in numerous ministry and I can be even reading my Bible when I can and yet not have intimate knowledge with God? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. And more importantly, it's what the Bible's telling you. That it, that's why it's so difficult for religious people to believe it. Do you not understand that Jesus Christ had the worst problem reaching religious people? Hey, the prostitutes and the tax collectors, they loved him. He was hope and life-giving water. But to the religious crowd, well, let's just kill him. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, 
He said, not everybody that's going to say to me, Lord, Lord's going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're going to stand before me one day and say, Jesus, you don't understand. I'm paraphrasing. We were religious. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons. We performed miracles. And look what the issue was. Not that they weren't religious. But Jesus said, I'm going to tell them, I do not know you. Jesus Christ said, this is eternal life, that they may know the living God and Jesus Christ whom they sent. Titus chapter 1 verse 6 says, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him. See, the first thing, if we're going to return back to God, we're going to have to quit acknowledging God while not knowing God. But I want you to know this secondly, making our way back to God, we're going to have to remove the rubble of sin. We're going to have to remove the rubble of sin. You're not going to recognize the rubble of sin in your life till you return to God and start knowing Him. But you see, we're going to have to, if we're going to turn, return to God, we're going to have to, we're going to face some obstacles. And the biggest obstacle we're going to face in our life, listen to me, is sin. It's not our schedules. It's not anything else. It's just sin. Because the Bible says, God said, if you'll return to me, if you'll draw to me, I'll draw I'll draw to you. We read that. See, one of the greatest obstacles that we need to repent of, now listen, watch, follow this. We're going to need to repent of root sins in our life, as well as fruit sins. You see, there are root sins that produce fruit sins. Think of an apple tree. It's got roots, and those roots is the source of that tree, and that's what enables it to bear the fruit. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you in the church, the worst thing we do in the church is we take care of fruit sins and we never deal with the root sins. Now, what am I talking about? I, I have done a cute little anacronym that came to me about 5 o'clock this morning. Well, I'll tell you how you can remember the root sins we're going to have to deal with. You need to think of the word pus. P-U-S. I know it's got two S's. I just got three points. Four points. Sermon's too long. Pus, you know, like a wound. It's got pus in it. What are the root sins that we're going to have to deal with if we want revival? Pride, unbelief, and selfishness. I want you to follow me for a minute. Let's talk about the root sin of pride. The root sin of pride, that, that's what makes us believe that we're the most important thing in the universe. Oh, I, I'm the most important thing in the world. Everything revolves around me. Hey, even God himself exists for me. The other Baptist church is about me. It's about what I get out of it. The discipleship's about me. The Sunday school's about me and what I can get. Brothers and sisters, that's the root sin of pride that's whispering to you. And then you got the root sin of unbelief. Unbelief is, is the sin that whispers to me and it makes me question God. It makes me question what God has told me about Himself. It makes me question my obligations to that God. And, and then you've got the root sin of selfishness. That, that sin whispers to me that I cannot be happy unless I get what I want. I, I can't be happy unless I'm exalted and I get my way. And I'll tell you what, I always put myself before I put others before myself. And I tend to consider myself first and foremost before I consider someone else's feelings, someone else's needs, including the Lord, including the church. Now I'm here to tell you that from those root sins, flow a whole host of fruit sins. Now we'd be wise today. Remember Jesus said to the religious people, he said, you like a dirty cup. On the outside you clean the outside, but you leave the inside dirty. You like whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but you inside are full of dead men's bones. Now true, in its context, he's talking about lost people, but that can apply to us sometimes when it comes to this issue of root sins and fruit sins. Because we, quite often in the church, we're willing to deal with fruit sins and we will not deal with the root sin. Let me give you a biblical example real quick. Numbers chapter 20, verse
verse 11, the Bible says when Moses lifted up his hand, he struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, now watch this, because you have not believed me. Now get that in your mind. Because you've not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Do you not see that Moses' root sin was unbelief? That this man of God somehow had not taken God's word to his heart? And it was his unbelief in God's word that led him to the fruit sin of striking that rock and dishonoring God? And you can go throughout the word of God and it's taught and you see root sins of pride, of unbelief, of selfishness. James chapter 4 verse 1. Listen to it. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? I think James might have been the church secretary at their business meetings. Just kidding. That was a joke. Y'all so tense today. You need a little moment of levity. Not a good joke when you have to explain. But seriously, back to James 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source of your pleasures? that wage wars in your member, you lust, you do not have, you commit murder, you're envy, and you cannot obtain, you fight, and you quarrel. You do that because you do not, you have not, because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Did you see the question? What is the source of all these sins? And he returns at the end and says what he said at the beginning, it's your pleasures. In other words, James says the, the, all these fruit sins that he names here, these fruit sins of quarrels and conflicts and lust and murder, envy and fights, is caused by the root fin, sin of selfishness that's been left unchecked. And brothers and sisters, if we're going to have revival, it's going to be a waste of time for me to deal with sin that is hanging on the branches by merely plucking that sin and putting that sin away. If I don't go to the root and the heart of the matter and deal with the root sin that's down in my heart that's causing me to produce those fruit sins. I say something hateful to a sister or a brother and I get called on the carpet for it and I go and I apologize to that sister or brother for that hateful word I said. And I don't go to the heart of the matter and deal with the root sin that caused me to speak those unkind words. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to have revival, we're going to have to deal with root sins. You see, the problem is not the power of the gospel. The problem is that we are refusing to let the gospel deal with the root sins in our lives. And that is why we have to keep dealing over and over with these same sins. How long are we going to keep dealing with these same sins that keep resurfacing in our lives? How long are we going to keep playing with God till we let God get down into the roots of our heart and change our hearts and get those root sins out? Yeah. Amen? We've got too much pus in our hearts. That may be the only thing you remember today. I want to close the last one. But talking about if we're going to make our way back to God, we're going to have to get biblical truth in the right order. Biblical truth in the right order. Now, the Bible gives truth in a certain order. And it does that for a reason, because there are some truths that are foundational and some truths in God's words that are meant to be built on that foundation. And if we're going to get biblical truth in the right order, here's the order we're going to have to give them. You ready? God. Number one. Two, self, me. Number three, sin. And number four, salvation. If we're going to be a revived people of God, we're going to have to get those four truths in the right order. Because let me explain something to you. What I believe about God is going to affect what I believe about all those others. Amen? If I get God wrong, I get everything wrong. If I try to reverse those and put them in a different order, then I'm going to get it all wrong. I'm going to get it all mixed up because the Bible starts with the truth about God. Listen to me. The Bible begins in the beginning, God. We read it like in the beginning, man. 
Do you not understand that the Bible is God's book? This is God's story. This is what God's doing in human history. This is what God's up to. God is a Bible that says He is a creator. And that makes God up here. That makes God big in our eyes. That God spoke and He created all that there is. In the beginning, God created me. I'm down here. God is big. If I get that truth right, then I'm ready to get the second truth right. Me. And brothers and sisters, you ain't never going to understand me unless you understand first of all God. Because if you don't understand God, me is going to be like this. I'm going to be God of my own life. I'm going to remake God in my own image. And if God is God, then I ain't far behind. But let me tell you the truth in the right order. God is up here. God is big. God is outside of creation. He's inside of creation. He is in time. He lives outside of time. God is big and I'm small. Because God created me. And the Bible says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, because you created all things, and because of your will they were created, and because of your will they exist. Brothers and sisters, that's me and you. We were created and we exist because of God. And if I get God right, I get me right, then I'm going to get sin right. All of a sudden, sin's not a a matter of, well, it may be sin for you, but not sin for me. I understand we've got a Creator. God is big, and He set the standard for right and wrong. He's the one that said don't have sex unless you're married. He's the one that said don't do this. He's the one that said don't do that. And I begin to understand sin's not my opinion. It's what God has said. And I begin to understand that sin's not just something that might harm me. It's a front against God's glory. And if I'm saved, I'm going to have to deal with it because I'm still in God's glory when I let sin stay in my life. And if I get God right and I get me right and I get sin right, then I'm going to get salvation right. I'm going to understand what it takes for a man to get right with God. That it's something God had to do. God had to send His Son. I couldn't work my way back to God. He's holy. He's infinite. And I sinned against His infinite holiness. And I can never pay that debt. Jesus had to pay it for me. And all of a sudden, I put amazing back into grace. Church, the Bible says draw near to God and He will draw near to you. And I don't know what God's doing in your life today. I'm just trying to prepare our hearts. I'm trying to preach some messages that people here don't like to hear because it requires a response from us. We'd much rather go to a mainline denomination church and hear something that would leave us feeling good about ourselves. But listen, God wants us to get real today. God wants us to quit messing around with Him. And God wants us to understand if we're going to have revival here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have to get ready to receive God when He comes. Amen? Amen. We're going to have to understand and pray out to God and cry, God, revival is your doing from start to finish. God, would you please break me? I ain't worried about my neighbor, my wife, my children, me. God, break me. God, would you please break me and then would you remake me for your glory? And God, when you remake me, would you pour me out into the world? And for God to break me, I've got to realize I've got to be intentional. And I've got to quit acknowledging Him in my life without really knowing Him. And there's things in my life that I've known for a long time that God's dealing with me and I'm not giving to God. Maybe they're root sins and I've got to be willing right now today, right now, to give it to God. Because I've got to get it right. God is worthy. He's up here and I'm down here. And right now I want to give you, God, a fresh. I'm saved. But right now, God, I want to put you back on your throne in my life. And I want to repent of whatever it is that you've been dealt with that I've been resisting. I don't know what God wants you to respond today. The altar's open if you need to pray. If you need to pray for yourself, you need to pray together as husband and wife. You need to pray for somebody else. The altar's open. I'd love to pray with you. Brother Tony would love to pray with you. I guess he's leaving them singing maybe. Come on, whoever's doing the singing. Come on. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ and salvation, you need to be saved. Brothers and sisters, the end's not far away. I don't know when it is. It's coming. Jesus is coming. He's splitting the eastern sky. You need to get ready. Death is coming if, it, if Jesus doesn't. If he delays, is coming. 
And if you need to be saved today, I won't pray for you. I want you to come down and let me pray with you. You can be saved. You can be made right with God. You can be made right with God by saying, God, I'm a sinner. I give you my sins and I believe what Jesus did on the cross. Make my payment for me and I trust in what Jesus did. And as I give you my sin and ask Jesus to come into my life, I'm giving Jesus my life. He's Lord over my life. The Bible says if you believe from your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, you will be saved. You can do that today. Let me pray with you, then we're going to respond. If God's been dealing with you about joining this church, this would be the time. Father God, I pray that whatever the Holy Spirit may be whispering, whatever he may be doing, I pray that you would give everyone here the courage to do it. Give us boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.